Welcome to the Microsoft Security Insights Podcast with your hosts, Franklin Grimberg and Edward Walton, where we discuss Microsoft 365 security and Azure security news and products. Recorded June 1st, 2022. Good evening, Franklin. Good evening, Brody. Good evening, Rod. Or yeah, good midnight for me. How are you guys doing? <laughs> and we have one extra guest host while I'm, while I'm bailing out. So don't forget our other guest host. Vishal is yeah, here as well. Yeah. Oh, man, for sure. I'm just I a mean, fly on the wall. I'm just a fly on the wall to poke on TJ and Lily. I saw they were here. Yeah. Well, you probably have a lot to, lot to say to them, my guess. So. What I'm looking forward to here in the rebroadcast of this, I'm not going to lie. So I'm going to stay up to one morning to continue listening to this, right? But, hey. Thanks, TJ. Thanks, lady, for joining, Michelle. Thanks for jumping on also and being a guest host while Franklin and I bail out. You guys are in great hands. You guys have a good night. I'll see you next week. All right. Have fun, Edward. Thank you, sir. Well, good evening. I guess we could kind of figure out, well, Ed's still on camera. I guess we'll watch him for a little while. Now he's gone. So good evening, Brody. And the shawl, I guess we'll kind of do the rounds here and figure out what everyone has been doing for the past few days since we last came together. I think we had our last show with Jing and Maria last week, right, for Microsoft Reactor. And that was an awesome show. Of course, what a show. Jing what a show. is awesome at being able to fit a, like 100 different topics into five minutes. So you still have to kind of decompress afterwards. You have to de-stress a little bit. So it was pretty awesome. Brody, what are you doing? Where are you right now? I am in Atlanta, and I will be here for 48 hours. We're going to meet with the customer. We're going to talk security, compliance, and identity. We might might drum up some work. And, you know, uh, tonight I'm going to go to a wing joint, and some of the Microsoft crew want to watch the New York Rangers take on the Tampa Bay Lightning. And I've got a few Tampa Bay Lightning in my playoff pool, so I'm wow. looking forward to getting to the hotel and then getting to dinner and yeah, things are good. So how long are you going to be there? How long are you going to be in town? Basically, it's, it's tomorrow, four hours of meetings tomorrow, and then I fly out on Friday, and yeah. it's a four-hour flight back. So I have double the flight time for the meetings. Uh, <laughs> well, that's so it's good. okay, though. Well, it's it's glad good. It's, does it feel good traveling? Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Like, it's beautiful weather down here. i got an awesome driver. and uh, What's the driver's I mean, name it's again? Just, his name is Joe. Joe. Okay. Yeah. Great guy. He talked me through how to get from uh, my terminal to the pickup spot in the Atlanta airport, which is that's awesome. Well, it's always good to know your driver in case there's some mishap, right? You, you've seen Thank those you. movies where it literally starts out, so the day starts out perfect, and then everything goes haywire and it boils down to finding your Uber driver, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And hey, the best part was the flight was only half full. So everybody had leg room and no one was bumping elbows and there's no oh, crying cool. anybody. So it was good times. Good times. Yeah. I, I'm hoping that I get that luck of the air flight um, next week as I head out to RSA. I'm kind of hoping that there's nobody on the flight. Um, I think TJ and Lily just said that there's a COVID outbreak. So if I can we can talk about that now and scare everyone else so that they just cancel all their flights. I'll have the airplane to myself. That's I had a question about Uber. Why is it when you need Uber the worst, they, they don't service that region or the location where you're like, Oh man, I'm <laughs> Uber. and you're waiting and waiting. And you're like, I guess they're yeah. not coming here. Right? I'm going to have to figure it out. TJ. Man, I was in the sh- Uber black. Ahead, you got to upgrade to it. Got to yes. upgrade yeah, to the Uber he's black. Right. You know? He's right. It's a higher quality service. I I, I no. scheduled an Uber in Charlotte and just a regular Uber. I'm like, I need this tomorrow at 8 a.m. And they were they were 20 minutes late. And like, I you, I scheduled it last night. Like, what's going on? And then you do the Uber Black, and it's way better. Yeah. So so I noted coming coming from the field, being used to being in the field. Um, I used to do that kind of stuff. I don't have the budget or the money to do that now. I feel like I'm I'm travel poor. I can't get those Uber Black things. I have to be very careful about budget these days. So, Wait, are you saying you used to drive an Uber Black, or you used to leverage an Uber? Black? Oh, I ju- I used to get the Uber Blacks. Yeah, I everything. Um, I, I won't go into great detail because somebody will be listening. Um, but yeah, I took advantage <laughs> of the perks. Very cool. Yeah. So, Vishal, what are you up to? You you should literally just be preparing to head out. Sunday, right? For are RSA. you in a fighter jet right now? 
I just watched I just watched Top Gun this last week with oh, a whole sweet. bunch of my buddies. Um, we all used to fly together. We're all making fun of each other because we all wear our, you know, our stuff, our, our leather jackets into the theater and all that. But after being so motivated of watching Top Gun, I figured like, you know, you spend years in the cockpit, literally in a small confined space, writing on your on your on your knee and doing all the things like the small space. I think for the rest of the week, I decided just to work from the, you know, the driver's seat of my car. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds safe. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, but I am, but I am, I, I am going to RSA on Sunday. I'm yep. super pumped. I get to uh, speak on the panel there on Sunday, get to meet a bunch of people. So that's going to be pretty, pretty sweet. And um, I mean, we're just, we're just seeing a lot of, of stuff for for federal right now and working a lot in the field so that's going awesome and you know i'm giving lily and uh tg over here a headache i'm sure every day <laughs> from where they sit but other than pretending i'm tom cruise and you know try to reconsider my career choices of going and flying f-18s again you know i think i'm doing all right you know yeah doing good well i look like you're doing good you you look just fine you were here what two weeks ago so obviously we didn't annoy you to the point where you didn't want to dial back in. So that's awesome. I just wanted to come back in because you guys had a bunch of back scratchers. I didn't make it back to my, well, my house for mine. Just we'll yet, wait. But, we'll wait. No. So, you know, we'll wait for you. That'd be fine. Uh, Brody probably did. Brody, do you have yours? You need to pull it out in front. No, of I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be a security risk. So I'm not, I'm not bringing anything <laughs> uh, see, that not could gonna, be so I'm not intended as a weapon. Then. I'm not going to yeah. bring mine down today until Brody brings his. Yeah. There okay. you go. Okay. Well, I, I'm the lone back scratcher. Uh, we'll explain yeah. that here in a minute. Todd, if you're if you're promoting swag, I would like to uh, give credit to uh, the uh, the Sentinel T-shirts uh, that came out. I bought three of them, including the hoodie, and have been uh, proudly displaying them uh, around town. And the KQL book uh, arrives this week, so super pumped on that. Excellent, as well. excellent. Yeah. So for those that don't know, there's a new Microsoft Sentinel T-shirt. Eh, it's kind of a community community driven thing. It's not uh, <clears throat> an official Microsoft thing, but uh, it says my sock doesn't suck, which was a phrase that was invented at a recent in-person conference. So it absolutely fit. I thought it was applicable. So there is, if, if you go to the must learn KQL merch store, it's, it's there. So it's, uh, I may actually wear that a couple times next week. Hopefully I won't get in trouble for it. Um, and speaking of RSA, I'm a little, uh, a little sad, but because um, Vishal mentioned, I don't know if he's even going to the pre-day stuff at all, but I had my ticket to get to the pre-day stuff, but I got a Dear John email about two hours ago saying, hey, we're we're dumping you for customers. So a little sad, but at the same time, it sounds like we're customers. really, it's that pre-day is actually kind of rocking. They're making more room for customers. So that's pretty awesome. Sorry to hear that, Rod. That's sad, but I'm That's sure okay. you'll enjoy the rest of it. That's okay. I, I don't need an actual invite. I'll sneak in some way. I can <laughs> always figure out. I'll pretend to be a caterer. Yeah. I'll, I'll carry a little tray around. You'll see me. Um, might have to, yeah, might have to dump that t-shirt, at least for the pre-day and wear something, act, some actual clothes so I can sneak my way in. But we'll Just see. walk right up to security and stay here with the MSI podcast. Like, there's no way they can't. Like, Yeah, I, I'm with the <laughs> band with the band yeah, there you yeah go. exactly <laughs> so we have a couple guests actual guests um tonight which i think super important and the topic is super important that we kind of want to discuss this evening but i want to turn it over to tj and lily you both can introduce yourselves however you want um give us a little background about yourself maybe you know what you do at microsoft and we'll get into some of that a little bit. I know TJ likes to think that he doesn't do certain things uh, that he does, but we'll talk about that too. Um, but they produce some really important content for our security folks um, and compliance. And uh, so I'll turn it over to you. And, and hey, tell us something a little bit fun about yourself as well. If you know, if you if you do that sort of thing. If not, I'll just make something up. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Do you want to go first? No, you go first. Okay. Um, my name is Lily Davidian. I work on the Microsoft Defender for Cloud product team. Um, I'm about to celebrate my five year at Microsoft. Ooh. When is excited. that, by the way? Mine is July 10th, I want to say. 
Okay. You may uh, get a, a special t-shirt or something on July 10th. I would love it. Do you want me to ping you my mailing address? That would be awesome. Okay, will do. So looking forward to getting my crystal. I need to find a place behind me to put it, obviously, so that I can um, exude that Microsoft wisdom. Um, I've been working on Defender for Cloud for about two years now. Um, really interested in, in kind of speaking to customers, seeing how they're using it, what we can do better, what we're doing well. Um, and TJ and I are, are really at that intersection of Defender for Cloud and Sentinel and how we can bring those products and the whole Microsoft ecosystem together to help customers tap into the investments that they have made in security. So really excited to be here and to talk about some of the offerings that, that we've put out recently, especially in light of, of RSA, where we're going to have some exciting announcements. Um, on, on a personal note, I am a lifelong Tom Cruise fan. Um, <laughs> ironically, sure. I have not seen either Top Gun, um, but I know it's it's a bit ironic, but that is on my oh, team. Oh, wow. Um, you haven't seen the original Top Gun? I know. Really, what are you doing tonight? You need to just go home and watch you it. Well, I was, oh, was, was going to yeah. do it tonight, and then someone put a five o'clock beating on my Ooh, couch. Wow. No, stop, stop, stop. Tell, tell you were going to do it. She was going to she was going to do it this weekend. Lily, what was it? It was Top Gun 1, Days of Thunder, Cocktail. You know, you, yeah. could, you could put Jerry Maguire in there, but I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, we... You've had this homework for a while. Yeah. I mean, I've, I feel like I feel like we've we just haven't been able to convince you to do it soon enough. I will so. say the room I take and rest and has a massive TV, so maybe this is. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. yeah. It just sounds like you're working too yeah. hard. Yeah. This yeah. like you're Surface hubs are good. Like Surface hubs are good for a reason. Use exactly. them to watch Top Gun. <laughs> I actually have a TV right here in my office, and I no can. Way. Yeah, absolutely. So is Top Gun playing on it right now? It is not. <laughs> no, it is it not. Be. Yeah. Um, I'm a little, the Top Gun thing interests me because, you know, there's been so many rave reviews of it. So I'm really interested in watching it. I did love the first one. Um, what really saddened me was the whole Val Kilmer, you know, and he's been uh, away from movies for a long time. I'm interested to see him in this one. So don't, don't, don't spoil it, anybody. Yeah, no spoilers. I also want to see it immediately when I get back home. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's airplanes in it. So that's, you know. I just kind of assume heard. That. and motorcycles, yeah. motorcycles. Yeah. 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 That's great, Lily. It's so awesome to meet you. Um, and I know, I think last time we were on the podcast, you were not here. For some yeah. This is a return trip. This is yeah. trip number two. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. This is the that's encore, right. but I think it was Brody. I don't remember who was stepping in last time. I was there and yeah. I, Forget who else, to be honest with you, I have a terrible memory. Know, it's wonderful to have you two back. Last time we were here, Brody promised that if we make five appearances, you get a VIP jacket and you get alumni status on the community. Yeah. So we're, oh, we're that'd be great. great. Oh, so yeah. yeah. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to create a jacket. Um, maybe even like a free sub or something like that. Free food. I like that. That'd be great. We'll add it to Edward's list of swag he needs to create on behalf of the podcast. <laughs> so now we need jackets. No problem. Okay, so this is time two of five. We've got a few years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but maybe for time two, we got like a, a, a hat or something. Oh. Yeah, you're already getting a t-shirt for your birthday. Now you want a hat. Uh, you know, we're, <laughs> well, we're looking at some red solo favorite. cups. July is also my birthday, though. Is it really? Yeah. A lot How did you plan July. that? That's super awesome. Yeah. You don't have to tell us your birthday date unless you want a second t-shirt. July 3rd. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I One tells before them. the five year. So. Right. Because well, I think we do have two different t shirts now. We also have the KQL is is the new PowerShell t shirt out now. So oh that's cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay, two t shirts for July. All right. I'm gonna have to really cut my travel budget so I can pay for that. So the good news is TJ yeah, my... has a fall birthday, right? No, I have a spring birthday. Oh yeah, I March baby. TJ's yeah. Birthday. Well, TJ's oh, birthday already passed, so you don't have to worry about that. I spend okay. It's oh, okay. Okay. pretending like it's not my birthday, yes. so I often forget. Yes. Yeah. So Lily, are you are you done with your introduction? Is there anything else you'd like to tell I us could about yourself? Going, but I feel like let's let's move on to TJ. Well, that's fine. Well, that's fine. Talk about. And maybe we could uh, dig deeper as we go along too. Who knows? Sounds good. All right. TJ, would you like to introduce yourself? And I, and I apologize. I guess I wasn't here the first time you both were on. I'm sure I'm pretty positive. First time you're on, we're probably talking about some kind of workbook, but um, yeah. TJ, 
We don't remember, but workbook is a safe thing. <laughs> the first time we were yeah. on, we had just released the Azure Security Benchmark Workbook. Oh. Which, while we're on the topic, we just updated. So, 3.0 now, right? Yeah, you should check it out. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and we just did a session on this for the Microsoft Security Preview community that's on. That's on. I, I wanted to include it in last week's newsletter. TJ said, whoa, stop the press. We'll do it next week. So, well, hold on. We actually got the best of both worlds because they hit the Defender for Cloud newsletter last week, and I believe it's staged for the Sentinel newsletter this week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We may Tons have to talk news. about that. Rod, you're going to be busy after this episode. Holy moly. You got t shirts, you got newsletters. <laughs> I also just recently signed up to write a, a zero trust, which is one of our topics tonight, a zero trust book. So, Wow. Just on the identity piece. <clears throat> so I'm doing that here shortly. Um, oh, that's part of our topic tonight, right? So zero trust stuff. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Heard of zero trust. Uh, <laughs> and, and we need to talk about that as Not well tonight. I think we need to talk about that as well tonight because TJ, go ahead and introduce yourself. And we'll jump into that here in a minute. Oh, okay. Hey guys, I'm TJ Benassic from the Microsoft Sentinel product group. Uh, I like to think of myself as a jack of all trades and a master of none. So uh, as of late, the focus has been uh, supporting and enabling our regulated industry customers with different content packages. And so um, what Lily and I found uh, in our, our travels, which are far and wide, is that we've got a lot of great products and we need them to fill use cases. And so domain-based solutions is where we put a lot of the focus over the uh, last few months and years and really just trying to, to make it easier with Azure to meet some of those uh, critical mission and business needs. A uh, little bit about myself, um, saw Top Gun this weekend. <laughs> um, and all I could think about was Vishal. Um, <laughs> it was like inject Vishal into all action sequences and it, it just made it a lot more relevant for me. Um, my father-in-law is a, a retired fire pilot. So uh, he and I went, uh, my friend Derek, and uh, we were able to get some perspectives that uh, it definitely was legitimate and uh, got super excited. It was the first time in three years that I've been to an, a movie theater, like an in, in-theater in theater. And I found that my local theater had put a massive amount of money into remodeling it um, since the last time that I've been there. And all I could think about was like, where did they get the money to make this theater so awesome when ticket sales were down during COVID? But I feel like oh, wow. the perspective was like, get people out of their house and make this place look as cool as possible. So I'm definitely going to go back potentially to see Top Gun again. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of where we at now. All right. We, we, we lost your, we lost your audio. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, there we go. I lost can hear your you. audio there for a second. Okay. There's better. It's funny because I'm in the office today and today I have gotten more like bad network quality messages than any day I work from home. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I can. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna get on my soapbox about that type of stuff, but um, well, maybe I will. Because everybody's streaming Tom Cruise movies. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's the yeah. problem. Network congested. Yeah. That network's congested. Do you There's know in the squadron? In the squadron, um, when when you're flying and you mention Top Gun and you quote it, it was a five dollar fine every time you did it. So I think we're up to about 55, 60 bucks already. I'm just saying. That's well, that's t-shirts. enough money for my two birthday and and. It required us. <laughs> it, it required us to stay on task, right? But I mean, that's fine. We should just put the put the jar out. So. Shaw's first time guest hosting and he's implementing all these rules. Oh man, <laughs> I feel so constrained. <laughs> it's like that when he comes into the office and rest in too. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you, or, or you feel empowered, you know? Just mm-hmm. keep, you could be like some of us who are like, oh, it's $5. Well, you know, just put the 20 on the table and just go at it, you know? Just love it. You know, you're gonna... Right now, $20 is basically $5. I, I mean, it's the jar is there, but most of the time we have to call the room to attention and salute and then carry on after we've uh, adjusted <laughs> completely. <laughs> I'm so happy you guys edit these podcasts, you know? So. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Frank's sick this week. It won't be edited at all. Yeah, so oh, mostly edited. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. <laughs> um, no, it, 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 it'll be fine. Um, so you, you, TJ, did you finish your introduction? I oh, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't want to interrupt. Want to make sure that we captured every little 
minute nugget. Hey, um, I kind of want to start out with this because I, I know you guys have a lot of things that you would like to talk about, particularly from an RSA perspective, what maybe not what's coming, but maybe a preview of some things. I definitely want to talk about the Zero Trust workbook um, and go down that route for a little bit as well. Um, one of the things that I caught early on, Lily, in your discussion. Now, I hear this a lot. So you talked about the Defender for Cloud and this and this Sentinel integration. I hear this a lot for customers. Of course, I make up my own my own explanation. Um, but let's 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 hear from you. Customers generally ask, um, "What's the difference between Defender for Cloud and Sentinel?" Should I use one or another? I actually had a question a couple of weeks back. Um, no, it was actually last week. I was delivering a session for the Game of Learners for South Africa. And one of the questions was, is Defender for Cloud a SIEM or a SIM, however you decide to pronounce it? And so I went through my long explanation. What's that? SIM. Um, yeah, it really depends. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's like a Southern, Northern accent thing. I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, We've had conversations about that. Yeah, security information event management system. I don't care what. And in effect, one product manager told me a long time ago some very wise words. We don't care what they call it as long as they use it, as long as they buy yeah. it, right? Not, so. not what you call it, how you use it. So yeah. it, it's a great question. Um, and actually one that's more common than you would think. Um, I think Vishal said once a while ago, it's it's not an either or conversation, right? It's, it's and. Do you want to use Defender for Cloud? with Microsoft Sentinel. So if we think about what Microsoft Defender for Cloud does at, at a high level, we provide the cloud security posture management and cloud workload protection kind of pillars. So we're proactively looking at your environment at all of your workload storage accounts, um, SQL servers, we're looking at your key vaults, your Kubernetes, your container registries, and we're scanning your environment continuously against the baseline and understanding your security posture. And in, in addition to just giving you that visibility of like, here are some misconfigurations, we're going one step further and saying, and here's how you can fix it. Right, So we're giving visibility and remediation all from that single pane of glass. And that's the proactive work that you're doing to secure your posture and to reduce the likelihood of being compromised. We know that there's no way to get 100% secure, to get that 100% secure score and just say, I'm, I'm completely fine, I can, I can walk away. And that's for a lot of reasons. That's because the cloud is dynamic, we're constantly deploying new resources, we don't have the best guardrails in place. So on top of this, this work that we're doing that's proactive, we also have the defender plans and, and the workload protection where we're alerting you on attempts to compromise your system. We're giving you all the um, kind of details about the incident, what happened, where, how you can look into it. But to do that like full investigation and to really understand how how attackers might be trying to compromise your ecosystem in and out of some of the resources we cover in Defender for Cloud, you want to get those insights in Sentinel because that's where it serves as kind of like a log aggregation platform. And you can look at what are the alerts, not only that you're seeing in Defender for Cloud, but you're seeing across your entire ecosystem. And when we say like entire ecosystem, we don't just mean other security tooling in Azure. We mean um, MDE, MCAS, which we've rebranded so many times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we mean third party tooling, right? So the power of Sentinel comes from that ability to aggregate first party and third party connectors and use things like fusion to really help you understand what your um, incident and, and, and threat protection looks like across your whole kind of suite. Yeah, that's good. I, I think another piece of that, and um, maybe you kind of stop short just a little bit, I think not just the security tooling, right? But that entire environment, right? So the hybrid cloud, yeah. right? On-prem and Azure, but also, um, and probably one of the primary reasons why we don't call everything Azure something anymore, we call it Defender something, is because it's not, it's not just focused on Azure, it's not just focused on Microsoft stuff, it's focused on you know other clouds like AWS and GCP and stuff like that, so. Yeah. I think we're really trying to push the envelope with capabilities within things like the XDR portfolio. Yeah. And for anybody that's worked in a security operations center, like if you know someone that has one tool on their SOC and that's how they run it, uh, I'd, I'd question they might have some gaps. Uh, most of the SOCs that I've built and operated are 10, 15, 20 or more tools that are working together. And 
some of the work that that we've done and that we're we're investing in is bringing that together to make that a more consolidated ecosystem. How do you make your tools work together on your behalf instead of spending all your time in 20 plus some tools? And so the pairing between Microsoft Sentinel as a SIM SOAR and Defender for Cloud as a, a workload protection platform really can't be understated. And so I can tell you well, 25 different ways that we describe it from a product group perspective, but just want to slim that down into a scenario. So Sentinel can tell you when you're being attacked. Microsoft Defender for Cloud can tell you where you're vulnerable. When you put the two together and you say I have a vulnerable asset being attacked, that's where it really makes sense. And that's how we're trying to push that envelope into future states and modernization. And I think two things from like a feature perspective that we've released recently in Defender for Cloud that are just amazing are the multi-cloud capabilities for the, the cloud security posture management. So the work that we're doing to scan, monitor, understand your AWS and GCP resources and to integrate that into our recommendations and to help you have that like one-stop shop is, is very, very cool. Um, we've just made an announcement about that in light of RSA. And the second thing that we've done is the Microsoft Purview integration, where when we think about what are your vulnerable assets, we use that data classification to help you prioritize because we know that you don't have time maybe to remediate everything. You want to get in and think about the most sensitive data, the most vulnerable assets, and and that integration really helps you um, accelerate time to response there. Yeah, so a couple things. First, kind of jokingly, do you think customers are hesitant or almost fearful of their secure score after connecting to AWS to Defender for Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> because it does it that adding new things constantly, right? So AWS, just whatever it happens to be, uh, doesn't that, and that's really where I want to get to is about the secure score. Um, to me, that's the most amazing thing is being able to quantify, right? You got the secure score and the things that you can do, those recommendations that you get and the things, the reactions to those recommendations are going to improve that secure score. Um, but at the same time, um, what is a good secure score? Because you say we'll never get to 100%. And then we throw in AWS and now we're down to like 20. Right? So, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, a lot of different ways to answer it, right? We wanted 100% at, at all times, right? That silver bullet of security to where we have no vulnerabilities and we can't be attacked. But we know that's not the, the world that we live in. More important than us telling you what your secure score should be is benchmarking where you currently are today and measuring that over time. So the continuous monitoring angle to say, if today I'm at a 35, I need to be improving on that continually, benchmarking that, you know, moving me on a path to where I'm watching more environments with a higher score and and lower blind spots. So you're really not measuring your score, you're measuring your blind spots and trying to reduce those and, and reduce risk. And through the Azure Security Benchmark Workbook that we've released, Um, you can really see your score over time through the Sentinel telemetry. And that's a great example of like the better together that we have there. And you can start to think about what you need to build in more proactively so that as you're deploying new resources, they're secure by default. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that absolutely need to highlight um, that better together story. Um, I always kind of look at it as um, Defender for Cloud is this thing that you absolutely must turn on as you migrate workloads to the cloud because it's going to help you migrate and configure things better, right? So it's going to give you that recommendation. You're like, hey, good job on spinning up that VM, but oh, you could have done it a little better. And here's here's the recommendation to do that. On the other hand, Sentinel is more or less that thing that's going to it's going to go beyond the recommendations. It's going to catch those 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 missing the things that people do on those. VMs and stuff like that, right? So, um, Rod, are you telling me that having RDP open on a, a public facing server is a bad thing? <laughs> uh, seems like it's an easy way to connect to it from anywhere d- in the world. D- I don't see the just, problem. Just hand your work device to your Uber driver and build <laughs> so, so, do expose that and measure the amount of time it takes somebody to knock on that port. You'd be surprised. No, no. Well, so yeah, live honey I always, yeah. th- this is something I do for my demos, right? So in my own environment, which is away from Microsoft, so I'm not, you know, impacting anything. Um, I will turn off just in time on some VMs. And it's literally within less than a minute that those things get hammered with some bot out there looking for public IP addresses, right? So 
Um, that's one of those super recommendations that Defender for Cloud is going to give us. Um, so that, and like I said, I, as soon as I turn on JIT, all my alerts just go away. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's that's so awesome. And if you're an Azure customer, there's no reason not to be using the recommendations because we actually provide that at no cost um, yeah. for all of your Azure resources. Yeah. I, I would say the the perspective that's it's an adversarial model is really important for folks in the cybersecurity discipline to to wrap their heads around. And, and I'd say that's that's a nod to the other side that this is a, a red versus blue um, endeavor, right? And mm -hmm. when when you host assets and you've got a blue team, guarantee there's going to be a red team on the other side. And uh, there there really is not an end state. It's a continual advancement uh, for each side to get an edge and for that uh, that uh, pivot of balance to kind of work its way out. And so um, understanding that that security is not in a vacuum, that like when you defend a network, you know, there's there's always going to be a level to where someone can circumcede it. So really pushing that that defense right a bang to be as advanced as you can uh, and maintain that state over time. So really getting back to that that benchmark because what your secure score today is, um, your attacker is going to be more capable tomorrow. So uh, always benchmarking it and advancing that model and closing those gaps. So I, I don't know if we want to go down this route or not. You can stop me if, uh, you know, it's just too much. Um, we, we announced something over the past couple of days, something new. It's not really something new. It's more of a amalgamation of things that we kind of have or has we've envisioned, but some things we already have. Um, and it's called Intra. And we'll talk more about it at RSA next week. Uh, how does this play into what we're talking about? Defender for Cloud and Sentinel. Obviously, Sentinel, you know, as long as we can inject the data, we can monitor it, right? Um, and we already do that to some respect for Azure Active Directory. But what, from a Defender for Cloud perspective, is there anything planned that you could even talk about? So it's funny. We just talked about this on our Team DL literally yeah. two days ago. I don't know. We have some exciting things. I don't know what is coming out at RSA and what we could share. Oh, I don't know if we can. I would say that we're well aware of Entra and the capabilities of that. But that's within the <laughs> we're, identity product. We're aware of Entra. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd say stay tuned. Uh, they're they're going to be leading the charge uh, for the yeah. RSA announcements. But we are super excited to see how that looks. Um Zero trust. We're talking about zero trust. Entra is a zero yes. trust uh, endeavor. And so uh, maturing that model, enhancing capabilities, uh, consolidating products uh, is, is definitely the name of the game. And that's going to be uh, a win theme in RSA uh, across multiple groups. Speaking of zero trust, I think Brody's getting ready to say something. He's back on camera. I was. I don't want to be rude and interrupt in case I have bad latency here. But yeah, one of the one of the aspects of Enter that was called out in the public announcement was the verifiable identities aspect, which is something I'm really interested in. Seeing Microsoft being one of the spearhead entities out in the out in the world pushing for that right now. So I can't wait to hear about these announcements. I think uh, sovereign digital identities for everyone out there in the world today is just something we need to move towards as a society. So it's good to see that we're pushing for that for enterprise customers and for identity management as a whole. Well, and, and when you think about it, um, <clears throat> you literally have zero security in your environment. I tell customers this all the time. You have zero security in your environment. You may think you're super awesome engineer closing down ports on a firewall or something, but unless you have identity managed, you literally have no, you have zero security in your environment. That's um I would stand by that as a true statement. Some people may argue, but I think that first pillar is absolutely important. Yeah, you can have all the security in the world. If someone's legitimately or illegitimately using your credentials, it's going to look like you. The environment is designed to allow you to operate with your credentials. And so yeah. um, identity is really that key pillar of zero trust to where uh, trust but verify at all times or conditional trust sometimes is another way that, that our customers have kind of relayed that. <clears throat> Speaking of zero trust, um, don't didn't the two of you release something release something recently about zero trust the workbook or something? I hate to say the workbook, just I don't, hey, it's I a don't solution. Wanna, you got on me last week. You all. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It, I don't remember that, but it sounds like something yeah. that we would do. TJ yeah. always gets at me for saying. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to type you typecast you as just like the workbook people, but 
you know. We are kind of the workbook people. I guess we kind of yeah, are. Yeah. Kind of oh my goodness, well, so that's so it sorry. Started as a There's workbook. a much larger workbook team you yeah. know, at Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you can't take all the small, credit for all the, the, the professionals that are contributing there. Um, it started as a workbook um, yeah. many moons ago, maybe like what, a year and a half ago? Yeah, a year and a half, two year, years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. And we got a lot of community feedback um, because we come on podcasts, we talk to customers, we host these kind of security preview sessions, and we got a lot of feedback from the community and, and from there it evolved to a solution. So we have updated the workbook and, and we're happy to kind of show that. Um, and we've also added some, some yeah. analytics rules and some playbooks so that we can think about the automation and, and how we can empower teams to better respond to some of the insights that they're seeing in the workbook. So I'm looking at it now, and yeah, I'd absolutely love for you to show this off. One analytics rule, three playbooks, and sorry, one workbook. Um, but yeah, this has turned into a solution. And can I say something? I just want to congratulate both of you. Uh, you're one of the first people to create a solution that when you update it, it actually puts a date <laughs> on the workbook so you know which one's the most current. Um, otherwise, those you just don't know what's what the most current thing is. So I truly appreciate things. that. Yeah, it's the uh, development uh, team out of Content Hub. And the intent behind that is we know that folks customize these, that they deploy new versions. And when you put custom engineering into a version of it, you don't want to accidentally save over that and lose it. And so folks will operate with often multiple versions as that offering has evolved over time. We initially developed it based on the needs for secure remote work during the COVID pandemic. And so we had a lot of uh, regulated industry customers that had a need to do remote work securely. Uh, the Azure Virtual Desktop platform really evolved during that time. And uh, an ask that we had was to develop a security architecture to help wrap our security offerings around uh, AVD and various remote work workloads to ensure that you could rapidly spin it up securely. And so there was a lot of thought leadership in this space and we've got a great Microsoft Zero Trust working group. What we were missing were technical solutions via code, right? You can mm -hmm. provide best practice and documentations and blogs and videos and demos, right? But when the customer says, I need to deploy something right now, that's what we were missing. Uh, the, the Rosetta Stone to overlay our technology into a Zero Trust approach and also overlay that to TIC 3.0. So trusted internet connections, uh, 3.0. The program has been around for quite a while. And um, zero trust is really, really different depending on, on who you ask, right? The universal pillars are the same, but how each vendor and provider or organization defines it is different, right? Different flavors, different approaches, similar intent, uh, just different ways to get there. And so uh, the tick office had done a great job of saying, it's not zero trust, it's not the same, but they had a very granular framework in how to apply technology uh, to the needs. And so the hybrid between zero trust and TIC created the ability to deliver code, to deliver technical solutions and frameworks that folks could deploy and rapidly onboard a workload securely during COVID. And, and it's it's had the steam from the industry. Um, it's, it's currently recognized as Microsoft's pillar seven for visibility and automation in zero trust. And we're, we're excited to see where the, the future of the offering goes. I think at this point, it's kind of hard to say because we drive our roadmaps based on customer feedback. Well, here's an important thing I, I think that a lot of folks don't realize when, <laughs> and in some ways it's good, some ways it's not so good. So um, zero trust is an awesome thing, right? Um, has all the capabilities, the different pillars. Absolutely. If you follow this zero trust model, you're going to find ways to secure your environment. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of our customers think that we invented this buzzword. And in some respects, a lot of our customers are going, oh my goodness, it's another buzzword Microsoft created and I, I hate it already. Um, it's almost like, I don't know, we need to rebrand or, <laughs> or something because people think it's ours. Do you guys get that as well or no? I think what we've heard more so is just customers have been promised so many like instantaneous zero trust solutions, or there has been such vagueness around what zero trust is that typically yeah. when we talk about this solution, we spend a good amount of time prefacing with like what zero trust is and is not and how Microsoft 
kind of fits into the industry standard thoughts around that. I, as a, a security practitioner in, in engineer by trade, like thinking that Microsoft invented it is, is hard to say. Um, if you trace the lineage of Zero Trust, it, it goes well, well yeah. ahead of what Microsoft has done in the space. Um, Forrester, even their white paper was preferenced by working groups. Google and, and Beyond Corp uh, put a lot of work into it until we got on board. And when Lily and I first became involved in it, it was, what, three, four years back to where um, it was a buzzword and there was a need for technical solutions. So I think... A lot of folks, you know, three to five years ago were kind of becoming aware of what zero trust could be. Um, and I don't think that there's ever going to be a universal definition of it. And I don't think we'll ever be able to agree on a yeah, singular or singular author. You know, I'd really go back to Forrester's work to say they were the first group that quantified it um, in their white paper. John Kinderwack and team put that together. I was able to meet him at a, at, at a conference and talk about you know, what they were thinking when they did that, as well as like the future state of zero trust. And, and they've even evolved like their definitions and framework. And I think it'll it'll continue to change. The technical implementations will never be the same because you can get there from a million different tools and approaches and whatnot. But the yeah. core of what you're trying to accomplish in zero trust is going to be the same. Just the journey and how you get there is going to be different. And it's it's always a journey. We're never going to put on a t-shirt and say we're zero trust, right? We're yeah. just going to keep doing it. Until, <laughs> well, <laughs> until I don't know. I can create a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The obvious joke here is we need to build trust around zero trust, right? <laughs> but yeah, to TJ's point, it's it's a mindset. And someone just who's coming from a sysadmin background, you think about how we used to structure networks, untrusted, trusted, internal, external, castle moat. And then you just start to understand that we just can't operate that way anymore, right? And so yeah. TJ's obviously got the entire history that he just rattled off there in the last three minutes. That's awesome. Um, but it's, yeah, how do we change the perception from it's a product, it's an offering, it's a buzz term, it's marketing to a mindset and a journey to TJ's point. I think it's really important. So I think TJ's new nickname is probably Wikipedia. Well, kind of. Yeah, it, I, I always like to go with the X-Files. The truth is out there. Trust no, that. That's awesome. Like yeah. Trying to, uh, <clears throat> trying to get zero trust in that approach. So you're like, you want zero trust, disable left click, your keyboard, your mouse, like, you know, the enter <laughs> button, anything you need until the, the network is completely unsustainable and it doesn't meet the the a CIA triad of availability, you know, in, in, in enabling that. So um, conditional trust, I think, is is a really good way to to look at it because trust is achieved uh, for the minimum amount of resources, and that's continually assessed over time. Anything about you, your digital access to a network that changes, should trigger that policy reevaluation to say, do you need access to this? How can we reduce or enhance that based on technical controls? And it does require quite a few technical controls and identity is, is the core of that uh, closely reinforced by network. Yeah. Well, and I think that's important. And I, and I think <clears throat> really, I think what we're talking about here is not, we're, it's not like we're leading the charge or we created anything. I think we're just kind of helping define it. Right. And, and in particular, we're kind of leading the, hopefully I, I've given Lily host access here so she can kind of share and oh, yeah. show us this workbook, which I think is, ultimately cool because um, really what we're trying to do is help define. And if you look at what we've done from a zero trust perspective and define the different pillars, each pillar needs to be managed or covered from a specific tool, right? So I think a lot of, in that respect, we've done, uh, utilize that zero trust model ourselves, even to start developing things that uh, customers need to help secure their environment from a tool perspective. So this is, I can see it looks great. This is the zero trust workbook or part of the solution, I guess. This, this is, is the workbook, workbook, which is part of the solution. Um, if this is kind of your first time seeing it, you can find it on con Content Hub directly in Microsoft Sentinel. Yep. So Sentinel users can go into Content Hub and search for the one of the solutions. Zero, zero trust. trust yep. Straight up. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of just start at the top and, and work my way through. Feel free to kind of jump in if you have any questions with TJ, if you want, want to add anything. Cool. Um, so if it's your first time, definitely recommend turning on the guide. Um, we get a lot of questions about how to use this, how to enable it. People are saying like panels. 99% uh, of those questions are, are answered in the guide. Um, this is really just a getting started. If it's your first time in the workbook, a lot about the RBAC, what roles you might need. 
um, some of the onboarding that you might need to do, setting up continuous export. If you're unfamiliar with any of the onboarding prerequisites, um, we always link you directly to that Microsoft source documentation. So if we're telling you, you know, enable continuous export from Defender to Cloud to Sentinel, we will take you directly to a, a how-to guide. Um, we have a lot of very rich documentation at Microsoft, but sometimes it can be hard to find what you're looking for. So we've we've tried to make that as easy as possible here. Um, and again, just, just a great place to start um, if you're jumping in for the first time. As TJ said, um, these are all very community powered. So if you're a customer of, of the solution, definitely recommend you, you take our survey. Um, this is all anonymous. I mentioned that we've really evolved from a workbook to a solution. And a lot of the changes that we've made have been based on feedback we've gotten through the survey. And, and from customers. So would recommend jumping in here um, and, and giving us your insights so we can help evolve this to meet. Do, meet do you generally get a lot of feedback from those types of surveys? Do people take the time to do that? Yeah, we get we great, get great feedback. Um, awesome. We could always get more. So yeah. if, if you're listening to this, we'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, yeah we've, had, we've had dozens of responses, you know, over the last 18 months of this one particularly. And um, it, it's hard to quantify consumption versus feedback and feedback mm -hmm. comes in, in all various forms and perspectives, but we've really uh, sought after that feedback to drive the roadmap of the offering to say when customers want to see something or they think that we could do more to take it further. Uh, that is a basically direct line to us, you know, we read everything that comes in. Um, we had one of our colleagues asked if um, we can define the amount of feedback, uh, like how many responses saying a certain thing would it take for us to improve this offering? And you know, they're like, is it five? Is it 10? I said, if it's one, if it's a good idea, like we can't, yeah. it's very hard to deliver a product with a vision of what you think it is versus what a user feels it should be. And so uh, providing that perspective, even, even one voice, one survey, if it's a good idea, we want to roll that into the offering. And I don't think there's been a perspective that we've received that we haven't worked to incorporate uh, somewhere uh, along the life cycle of, of this offering. So for, for our listeners out there that are viewing this and, and you see the first version of this versus where it is now. And, you know, for the folks that have put in feedback, you'll see where your feedback is in the offering. And so it's a, a much greater collective than just our product group. This is an industry driven solution based on feedback. And so I think there's really a lot more contributors to this offering than, than just Lily and I and, and our product groups. Hey, Rod, you know, one of the cool things is like, I don't think people understand where many solutions that are put out into the market, they're, you know, you put it out there, there's a rev one, there's a rev two, you know, you, yeah. you, you, you provide feedback. You've got Lily and TG on here. So for everyone that's listening, like we were literally in front of a customer a few weeks ago with Lily they provide the feedback real time. And I think within 24 hours, we saw, we saw the change in the solution. So, That's you know, awesome. they're trying to make it so easy with how we frame zero trust into everything we do or any of these solutions, right? Whether it's zero trust, whether it's the CMMC, whether it's any of the solutions that are released here, if you put the feedback in, it's literally yeah. going real time <clears throat> to them for those changes. So, I mean, I don't think they've hit a limiter button yet. So anyone who's listening, <laughs> you put this on, you put the feedback in, it goes directly to the, those two individuals you see on the screen. Well, and, and that's, that's, that's another important point to highlight. I think, you know, I talk to customers about this. Um, anytime that you open up one of our cloud-based tools, you always have the most current version with the most current threat intelligence with the most current features it's not like the old days where you literally had to take everything down and upgrade it yourself and, you know, have this gap of time where whatever that thing just didn't work the way that we work these days from a modern perspective, tools should absolutely work this way. They absolutely should. And if a person's a organization's tool doesn't, then you have to start scratching your head going, man, huh, I wish I could do that. Right. So. One of the reasons that we evolved it from a workbook into a solution was making this content actionable. So you'll notice <coughs> really sharing in the dark theme with blue text. Anything in that blue text is a deep link, meaning there's a drill down. And visibility has always been kind of a key. Like you're, you have a security architecture. How many folks can, can use the fabric of a cloud to show you that on a single pane? 
And I, you could never say it's a, a silver bullet of security. Like the most common use cases, folks will report on the status of their cloud. You get a single click deployment, but folks put in work, they customize these, they evolve them over time. They put in their, their own perspectives, their own notes, their own capabilities. And so it's designed to drive an engagement, to drive a journey, to, to make it your own. We just wanted to do as much of the legwork as we possibly could to make it possible for a hundred level user to, to deploy a cloud workload and secure it and at least provide the ability to benchmark that, to see that over time, to understand where we recommend that they put in time and work. And then when their security leadership, their CISO, their CIO, their regulators say, what's the posture of your cloud? That's an incredibly hard problem to solve, you know, yeah. on a single click export. So this thing goes to PDF in, in 15 seconds and you can hand it off. And it doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect, but um, it's gonna give you the visibility to make a very well-rounded assessment very rapidly to understand, you know, where do I need to be? What's my benchmark? What's my plan of action and, and milestones? It does that. And with the uh, the deep links, we're not going to provide you any problem or recommendation without a deep link to a solution. So when you see a problem, there's going to be a solution behind that blue click. Um, you don't need to stay eyes to glass. That's why we put analytics and hunting rules and automations to where even if you're not a user of this cloud, you can receive these insights um, in your email and your team's chat uh, and Power BI on your mobile app, you name it. Like we really want it to be extensible. And it all started with a vision and, and talking with our customers to say, if we were to create something to solve your hardest problems, what would it look like? And that's where a lot of these start. And life cycle and journey is kind of hard to say because we want, or we know that our customers drive these a lot more so than we do with their feedback. Yeah, so I think kind of with that, um, let's talk through some of some of what you just mentioned. So. Um, after the, the getting started here, we have exactly to CJ's point, like deep links to learn more about the Microsoft Zero Trust model, about the trusted internet connections framework, if that's not something you're familiar with. So everything is clickable. Um, if you are jumping in for the first time and want to learn more, you can also look at a demo that we recorded. You can read our blog that talks a little bit about the use cases, the benefits, um, what's changed since this was originally just, just a workbook. So all of that is, is embedded here. Um, when we think about actually getting started, um, really great filters for subscription, for time. Uh, we want customers to be able to have kind of the framework to do a lot for us to have done a lot of the legwork, but then also to customize this as needed for their organization. So through Azure Lighthouse, you can look at your multi-tenant view. You can look at one subscription, all of your subscriptions over time. Um, and we make it really easy to, to kind of filter that just in one click, one drop down, and it will update all of the panels below, which is very cool, very straightforward. Um, to start, if we just have a look at the executive summary, this is pulling in the recommendations from Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, Defender for Cloud is how we do that continuous monitoring of our environment. And it gives us insights not only into where we may have a misconfiguration, but also how to remediate. So here we see our posture um, relative to the control families. And let's say we look at this and, and we think, okay, maybe in, in networking, we, we would want to do some more work to get a little bit more green here. Um, we can filter um, and, and look just at that at, at that view and all of the drop down below will will kind of filter through in in a few seconds. So here we can have a look at some of our Defender for Cloud recommendations um, that we would need to do to better meet this control family. And if we decide that there's one that we want to remediate, we can click on it directly in the workbook. It will take us to Defender for Cloud. Um, all in the same the same interface. Um, of course, I, I can only see half my screen because of Zoom, so I, yeah. <laughs> I click one. That's all healthy, but in in a situation where you have a recommendation that you need to remediate, it will show the unhealthy resources, and you can fix it in in one click, all from within the workbook. So you don't need to authenticate. You don't need to leave um, where you are. You can see everything from from one pane of glass. That's awesome. Um, if we scroll down, we can also pivot this data and look at it in other ways. So let's say instead we want to understand how our assets are doing and which ones are maybe healthy, which ones we need to focus on. We can see all of that data here um, and we can pivot directly to the asset if we feel like we want to make changes at that level. 
The other helpful thing we see thanks to kind of the rich power of the sentinel telemetry is the understanding over time. Um, so here we see that there's this huge spike in recommendations on Saturday, May 28th. So it's possible that we've deployed some resources that aren't healthy by default. We've come back in and remediated a few days later, um, but moving forward, it, it would be important to try and keep this in more of a straight line. So how can we, again, like build in guardrails, build in automation um, to stay secure over time and not be kind of chasing that posture and, and that secure score. So this, this is kind of a high level of the executive summary. Um, a few other things we've added just based on customer feedback, the controls crosswalk is a way that we've mapped the zero trust controls across additional compliance frameworks. So we found that customers in the regulated space are, are thinking about other um, standards like NIST, and, and we wanted to see how we can map to those as well. So for customers um, thinking about other frameworks, you can kind of easily see that here as well as what Microsoft products may fit in um, to, the, to the story. Um, Vishal made a comment about kind of us incorporating customer feedback quite quickly, and, and it's actually the, the recommended data connectors played. So one thing we heard from customers is they wanted to better understand what they needed to enable in order to better use the workbook and, and what data connectors are, are, are imperative, um, which ones are maybe nice to have. And so we've added this tab here where you can have a look at foundational data connectors, like things we really recommend that, that you enable from the get-go um, and, and kind of other ways that we've, we've drilled this down so that if it's your first time jumping in and you have a connector maybe that you haven't enabled and you want to, um, you can again follow that, that deep link here and, and learn more about enabling it in just a few clicks. That's awesome. Of course, you need more, <clears throat> you need more access there to be able to do that, but that's okay. Yes. Poor and, Lily. She can't. We'll have to give her access and t-shirts. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I need both. Here, yeah. Here's a question that <clears throat> immediately comes to mind when I when I look at this and I think about this, and I think about zero trust and the different pillars. I saw in the controls crosswalk, right? You talked you listed out the different pillars, or at least some of the pillars in relation, but we don't necessarily do we talk about the tools that Microsoft provides for each of those pillars. Is there a spot or is it, it's all the way over there? All right. There is a spot, yeah, there is a spot. So we've aligned it with Microsoft offerings. And the reason we've done it this way is we know that there are customers using third-party tooling. And so when we think yep. about Microsoft offerings, this helps customers say, okay, maybe I'm not using um, uh, XYZ Microsoft solution, but I'm using a similar one and I can bring in that data to get similar insights. Well, the other thing I'm thinking too, so yeah, <clears throat> customers absolutely do use those other tools um, and want to be able to integrate. But the other piece, that, the one that I find that's most common is we have a lot of customers that literally have everything. They own everything. They have E5, they have literally, and they only use 10% of that stuff. Yeah. So if they look at this, they're like, well, zero trust. Yeah, let's let's jump into this. This is going to, they'll be able to look at this and say, oh, I actually own this. We're not using this, or at least maybe their manager so, might say, hey, why aren't we using this? I don't know. So, so Lily, you see the search field type key vault or just maybe key. So you'll notice that it's free text searchable to do exactly awesome. that. And so it's not only an index to navigate the control cards within the offering, but also to do exactly what Rod is saying to where if I have key vault, where can it protect me? You know, it, it tells you exactly where it overlays, where you can see that tool in practice where you have coverage. Um, there's also the ability to export to Excel, uh, which is on the right underneath the uh, Fishall's camera feed right now. Yeah. <laughs> I can, can I move oh, this? there it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And if you click that button, it exports to Excel. And so uh, the recommended overlay will be Microsoft Tech, but folks have really asked for the ability to take that overlay and put it in Excel. So yeah, if yeah. you're using a different identity source or a different EDR platform, like a CrowdStrike or Semantic, um, it's as easy as a control H replace on one of those technologies with your third party capability uh, to, to build out your own. We know folks have made investments. We're very big on community and ecosystem to understand that you know the investments that, that you've made, you wanna bring those with and you wanna integrate it. And if you're all Microsoft, great. 
uh, you've got a plan there if you want to tweak it for hybrid and multi-cloud and, and third party. You know, we're very open to that and just trying to make it as easy as possible for you to, to see those <laughs> and see where your solution fits. Yeah, I love that. I love this. I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Well, <clears throat> actually, I think everything you two do is super awesome. <laughs> um, and very impactful, I must say, for um, our customers. I think it's super awesome. So, um, um, Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I, how, how much, you know, lauding do you want? <laughs> we can keep listening. Yeah, I figured. There, there are a few other things I want to show. Um, so TJ and I have spoken <laughs> about a few other solutions that um, we have in the tooling, like the Azure Security Benchmark Workbook. And so if you're in Zero Trust and you want to see something else, we have the recommended content tab here where we link all of the other solutions that we've, we've shipped in this space. And if you don't have them, you can use our kind of very easy <clears throat> Azure or Azure Gov, depending on what environment you're in, um, and you can get started with that as well. So um, I've spoken a lot tonight about the, the Azure Security Benchmark V3 workbook. If that's something you haven't seen, um, you can have a look at the blog, you can learn more with the demo, and, and if it's something that's interesting to you, you can um, get that up and running in your environment in, in just a few clicks. Yeah, that's something I was going to ask next. Um, this Zero Trust obviously is huge. I think it's awesome. Um, but how many solutions slash workbooks have you two put together over the past time? year, year and a half, something like that? We've shipped 10 of them. So that's great. They, they average a code base of about 25,000 lines of code. So it's, it's sitting somewhere around a quarter million lines of code right now. And <laughs> um, we're doing our best to maintain each of them uh, to make sure there's the latest and greatest. Uh, every new one that you see is pushing the envelope. Yeah. And so uh, it's, a, it's a labor of love to ensure that all 10 uh, stay on, on that standard. Uh, yeah. And so you may be giving feedback in one of these and you'll notice it appears in all of them because we really try to try to do that. And it drives the question, why do you need 10 of them? Um, and it's because they're geared towards one of the hardest challenges in cybersecurity, which is compliance and regulated industries all have their own flavor that they care about. And so these are all very unique, um, but the interface is the same. We designed it on the same interface. So when you learn one of these, uh, if you're doing Azure Security Benchmark, um, you're like, I love the interface. I know what's going on. You open up any of the other ones and it's riding on the same interface. So very familiar experience. Um, regulated industry customers will, will use several of these. So if you want to mature your SOC with CMMC, if you want to look at insider risk management, if you want to do IoT security, you name it, you're, you're going to understand these offerings and learning one of them is going to scale a, a lot further beyond what the interest is into a lot of different capabilities. And so some of the feedback that we'll get within the products is folks will invest in them and they'll be kind of at a maybe 100, 200 level understanding of the products and say, I want to get more out of it. How do I do it? And for our solution, this is the way to get more out of it. Um, these aren't coming at cost. This is return on investment. If you're invested in the products, you deploy these at no cost. We're just trying to, to give you more with, with the investments that, that you've already made. Yeah. Um, and I really, I want to kind of set this one up for Vishal's perspective because he knows a lot more than we do in the field. But um, in the customer engagements that Lily and I do when we show these to folks, um, usually at the leadership levels, is um, they're looking for that modernization state. Folks are coming from and the hybrid and they're looking to modernize in the cloud. Everyone's on that journey together and a lot of the regulated customers are in similar places. And so when they see this, they say, I don't know what my modernization strategy looked like. I've got a vision. Um, but when I see this, that's that's the vision that I want to take. Like, how do we how do we see our environment through that lens? And so this thing really is a lens and that's some of the feedback that we're getting from, from the folks that are using this now. And I'd, I'd really tee it up to Vishal to say, you know, what kind of feedback is, is the industry providing on this? What, what's the value add? If you're seeing this for the first time, why do you want to use it? You know what, it's funny. One of the, one of the biggest pieces of impact here is um, I was just speaking to someone else about, you know, our federal auditors, for example, for the sovereign sovereign perspective, they're going in there, they're, they're assessing the environments, compliance is a big deal, but to make it easy to show them that they're meeting all of those specific standards, those specific um, requirements that they have. So for example, the zero trust piece or the, or the CMMC work, um, workbook or solution is, is an easy export, right, for them to 
to be able to see that show that they are meeting the intent to the best best means possible and, and what and that's the perspective we're getting is there most of these are being solutionized or, or utilized in a reactive sense what we're starting to see though is the conversation started to shift from hey we have a sim we have a sore we have you know to hey how do we utilize this product or this tool set to really drive how we're going to structure our sec ops next year and what i mean by that is exposing right costs and our ability to store data right meeting the comply or the storage standards for the federal government of you know hot data over the next 10 12 14 months and how to be able to hunt on that and that's really what this is turning into it's going from that reactive state to meeting the the intent of auditors and being able to have a report to print out say hey this is what we're doing to oh wow we're actually we're actually be able to utilize you know a platform or a solution to show how we should be hunting on data how we should be storing data where you know how accessible it should be or or any of that and it's bringing all of that together so i think we've got some work to do as an industry specifically in the federal space or in in the sovereign space of of solutioning like having a single single place to go for that but i haven't seen anything else in the industry that ties in the tools and the 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 products and the and the let's say the cloud services in and aligning it to industry standard and that's that's what i see here so it's it's kind of hard to frame you know what what our what our customers are looking for because this has never existed and yeah. and i would argue to say it's never it doesn't exist anywhere else right i mean am i wrong tj i mean what you're building right now i haven't seen it with any of i, w- I won't say competitors but our partner cloud organizations right they they're not building things like this to be able to go say Hey, I need I need this data for X amount of time. This is how much it's going to cost. And by the way, this is how I'm staying compliant with, let's say, the EO or with with CMMC and things like that. Yeah, I think it's it's a very valid perspective. Um, a, a lot of that that message in investment from Microsoft came down from our CEO Sacha Nadella, and I know Vishal, uh, you and Sacha talked uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and our, our conference downtown DC. And- I listened. He'll, he'll remind us. Go ahead. I yeah. listened. I listened a lot. Oh, I I took a lot of grief on this call out. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Not a big deal, eh, Vishal? Not a big deal. I don't know him like you. So. In the communicated message. We knew that the investments were there in our product, and, and such as uh, messaging has been there that that we take cybersecurity very seriously. That we're putting incredible investments into this and. Um, with our group, you know, we're, we're definitely on the, the bottom end of, uh, of the scale, right? We knew from a product group perspective that Microsoft had put the right investments into the security stack, but also understood that there is a level of complexity with that many tools in an ecosystem. And we needed to do a much better job in not speaking Microsoft product language to a customer. There's a lot of products, a lot of names, and they change. Right? We wanted to speak customer to customer. What does the customer understand? They understand NIST, they understand CMMC and Zero Trust. Um, so let's, instead of pushing products that, that we want our customers to kind of wrap their heads around, let's let's uh, speak customer through our products. Um, and that was- yeah. You just hit on something really important. And, yeah. and this maybe goes back to what you asked me earlier. We're, we're talking about a product. We're talking about a solution. We're talking about our customers. Hey, if you want to understand what Zero Trust is, if you want to understand what all of this is, use our products to do it. I think instead of looking at it that way, the way I look at it now and what I've taken, not just from our CEO, from Satya or from, from you know, um, Charlie or from Vasu or, or even Ann, any of them. What I take from that now is let's stop looking at products and let's see how we can yeah. open up our own solutions to be inclusive of everyone else's, right? And that's what this does, right? This isn't just let's plug in Microsoft into it. It's let's make it inclusive to GCP, to all the AWS CloudTrail data. Let's make it inclusive to everything else that everyone has so that no matter where you are in your maturity, we can align it. And that's what that's what this does, right? That's what our customers are asking for. They're not, I think when you looked at the original Jedi, piece and now we look at jwick moving forward it went from 
let's award this to a single cloud provider to, hey, this is going to be multi cloud. This is going to be a stretch between everyone. And that's what we have to build these solutions for. If, you, if you're looking at something besides Sentinel, if you're looking at ArcSide, if you're looking at Splunk, if you're looking at any of that, awesome. Let's find a way to combine that with what you have here so that you're set up for success later. Because no one's asking everyone to shift from one cloud to the other or, or do that right away. I think we have, to, we have to be able to tie everything else in. And that's where that that feature comes in. What are, what are our customers asking for, right? What type of connectors do we need to have? What else do we need to ingest? So it really comes out to the non-Microsoft stuff that our customers are really asking for here. Yep. Yep. I absolutely agree. We're, we're trying to get them, Good right? Call. Trying to help them get to that secure, modern landscape. And we well, we're can't... doing things like with, you know, we just announced today, for example, um, when you look at like enterprise SASE solutions and things of that nature, iBoss right? Yeah. Bringing like zero trust to the edge and that, and then being a MISA partner and now connecting that into Sentinel. So even, even solutions that allow us to take zero trust outside of the purview of Microsoft and then tie that back into solutions like Sentinel, that's huge <clears throat> for us, right? And then bringing them into other parts of our organization like MISA um, is awesome. So that was announced earlier today, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that just goes to show this isn't just us solutioning, it's us partnering and bringing that into things like this. Yeah, it's perfect. All right, so I uh, I do want to leave time to Lily and TJ to talk about anything else that you're proud. Well, let's just do it this way. Let me ask you a question. So I know, I know personally what it's like to create content, the time investment to do updates and all that kind of thing. Um, it, it's it's almost like giving birth. Not that I've given birth, but um, I have had a kidney stone, which they tell me it's more painful, but we won't have to talk about that. Um, but it is to, you know, doing this and, and producing these solutions, which are awesome. Um, which one I'll ask both of you, you can respond, which is your favorite child? Can go first? You go first. This is uh, a question. I've never heard the answer. Yeah, we've, we've actually never been asked that. Um, I think that M2131 is very special for the amount of customers it unblocked in the space. And then Azure Security Benchmark for me coming from Defender for Cloud um, is one of the more, more exciting and, and closer to home ones. All right. <clears throat> that yeah. sounds good. TJ, uh, do you have one or it's just which, which one, right, tomorrow you would send straight away to college or I, give them the keys to the Porsche? I love all my children equally and they all have different. <laughs> no, no, no. On their do that. Journeys. Um, um, I don't think it's fair for, for us to say which one that we like the best. Like we really want the customers to say which one was the most impactful and uh, we would like consumption, you know, how they, how they're doing um, along their journeys. Right. Cause they're, they're produced at different times. And so consumption, uh, is different numbers. The CMMC solution has yeah. the largest following uh, because it was the first one that we did about two, two and a half years ago. And so the user base is really strong, especially in the government cloud. Um, M2131, we did that because Vishal said so. Uh, Vishal had it's a my favorite one. Just, just, I don't, just, I'm just going to throw it out there because it's applicable outside of our space. <clears throat> and I really feel like ADX and log analytics is a huge thing because everything is security. I'm just going to plug that. I, you could say I said so, but it is truly like- Michelle it, it and right Dale um, came to us um, months ago and said, there's a need to do more with uh, event log management. Like this is a new framework. This is a really different way for the US federal government to look at a framework. And so we started with saying, what about the other ones that we have? Like Azure Security Benchmark kind of does some of this. And the more time that, that we heard them out and, and listened and talked with our customers to say, um, this is different. Like there was not an industry framework to show you how to mature your log posture, right? Mm -hmm. And that gap created a lot of challenges. Um, and I don't want to get into kind of what that framework is, where it, where it came from and what it intends to do. But whether you need to be compliant with it or not, everybody needs to mature their log management. And moving to the cloud uh, requires a lot of expertise. We wanted to make that easier for folks. Um, so a lot of folks turn that on and say, wow, I'm already halfway there. I didn't even know it. Like I didn't understand how to, 
had a baseline log maturity. And so that's been really key. Um, that one's great. Um, the NIST SB853 solution in the top right, I'm going to kind of take a nod to that. Um, when we went about creating these, um, there was an objective to get to the point of being able to produce a NIST 853 version. And two years ago, the platform wasn't there. We had to mature these over time to hit that end state. Um, in my opinion, NIST 853 is the most comprehensive controls framework on the planet. So being able to um, put our products and our frameworks around that uh, in a single click deployment across the security architecture and ecosystem was was really key. And so um, I still can't tell you what my favorite is. I would say that the NIST one is the most recent one that we've published. So we're really excited to see where that that journey goes within the customer needs and, and kind of interest for that offering. And so um, all of them are going to continue to grow. Uh, and I think uh, it's just going to take time to understand which one's the most valuable for the customers. And we yep. continue to, to look to you guys uh, and your feedback to say what's the most valuable for you, which one do you guys like the best? Maybe we put out a poll or a survey. And, yeah, and maybe we people. can include a poll in the surveys. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. So what's 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 next for you two? Is uh, anything you can talk about on the drawing board? Something you might be working on or can't do that? Uh, as soon as it's more public, you guys will be the first to know. Oh, that's super awesome. So you'll come back. Of yeah. course. We got to hit the five five trips so we can get our <laughs> Your free sub. Yeah. Looks like Brody is finally jackets. in his hotel. Are you in your hotel, Brody? I am. You know, they upgraded me to executive I because I said I knew Vishal, who knew Satya. <laughs> oh, so yeah. The front desk basically oh, bent over God. and they're like, oh, well, wait. Absolutely need to uh, absolutely need to upgrade this gentleman I, I right away. I took crud everywhere else until I got to Microsoft, and now I'm taking it here as well. You know. So, so if you're with Satya <laughs> next week, uh, I'll just I'll, I'll just leave you alone, okay? At RSA. Jeez. Hey, Rod. Maybe I. I mean, I. Yeah. Maybe I sneak you into the pre-day on Sunday. I would love to do that. I'm just. I'll maybe I'll just. I don't know. Maybe 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 just be nice to me. <laughs> 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 that's that's not hard to do. That's not hard to do at all. I could I, I could actually I could absolutely accomplish that. Maybe I should just uh, pick up a SFO shirt at the ho at the airport and not look too much like a like a tourist. You'll see um, me. I'll be the guy that's dressed like Tom Cruise. Oh yeah, I believe that. <laughs> oh man, yeah. <laughs> too funny hey i was hey by the way team i was listening the whole time and just was just checking in and tj and lee i just want to say um thank you on behalf of people who are at the 100 level and want to utilize these solutions and not deep into the whole the whole stack because we need to make this accessible for everybody in every organization level regardless if it's enterprise down to smb so just thank you for i know you, you emphasize that you could just pick this up pretty easily you know, with little to no background and training. Obviously, we've got a bunch of great training resources out there on MS Learn, MS Learn KQL, et cetera. But just want to say thank you for making it more accessible. And yes, we need to work with industry partners towards, you know, dealing with our common adversary, right? Regardless if it's technology partners or competitors, whatever you want to refer to them as. Thank you for your work. Really appreciate it. Yeah, truly appreciate it. What you guys are doing, you, I mean, yeah, everybody can say it's impactful, but I, I think at the end of the day, I think a lot of people really appreciate what you all do. So even if you are the workbook people, um, you're doing a great job. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you much. Awesome stuff. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Vishal, thank you for co-hosting this week. It's been, you'll have to come back I'm and do it again. I'm literally listening half the time. You know, <laughs> oh no. Riding just, car. just being here gave us confidence to get through it all. So I appreciate that. And Brody, thanks for joining. Frank, for being here, even though he's sick. And Edward, for showing up at the beginning from Athens. Oh, he was in Crete, I guess, this uh, evening. So Crete, yeah. Crete. Uh, he'll be back next be week. Good. Be good. I'll be at RSA, so I won't be here. Unless I do a Brody and I bring my Uber driver in. Hey, everyone, open up a workbook. Go into the feedback and just say hello to Lily. and TV. <laughs> That would be great. You know, yep. anyway. <clears throat> and maybe she can come back on her birthday. Sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everybody, for joining. Thanks a lot. Talk to you next Thanks, week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Oh, by the way, Frank, uh, we need to get like an ending audio thing for our podcast.